This is the video for the higher level content from D4.1 on natural selection. Now we know that individuals that show a high degree of fitness have a greater probability of contributing to the gene pool because they're more likely to survive and reproduce. Let's make sure that we have a good understanding of what gene pool means. Gene pool is all of the different genes and alleles in a population. So this ball pit here would represent the gene pool, lots of different alleles and genes in a population. Large gene pools have a lot of diversity, whereas when we say small gene pool, we mean something that has little diversity. It's important to note that you can have a big population with a small gene pool if their genes do not show a lot of diversity. When gene pools remain unchanged, they are at what we call genetic equilibrium. And they are remaining unchanged because all of the individuals in that population have an equal chance, so look at those root words here, an equal chance of contributing to the gene pool. When we say contributing to the gene pool, that means that all organisms or individuals in that population have an equal chance of surviving, reproducing, passing along those genes, and contributing to the gene pool. Natural selection disrupts genetic equilibrium, okay? And the reason that is, is because natural selection involves individuals having an advantage. So in genetic equilibrium, it's an equal chance. Natural selection gives individuals an advantage, making it more likely for them to contribute to the gene pool. So for instance, I've shown this um, example here of antibiotic resistance, that without the antibiotic, all individuals have an equal chance of surviving, reproducing, and contributing to the gene pool. So we would expect the proportions of resistant and non-resistant bacteria to remain the same. Once there is a selective pressure, and in this case it's the antibiotics, some individuals will have an advantage over others, and then they will reproduce more often, which changes the gene pool. So you can see how the gene pool has been disrupted here by natural selection. And you can really see this very clearly in examples using databases showing certain alleles. So we'll look at two alleles in humans, and they are in relatively geographically isolated populations. So let's take a look first at this one that you might be more familiar with. So I can take a map of sickle cell alleles, and I can put them um, in, into a, a visual to show the geographic uh, distribution. So we can see that there's a high concentration of sickle cell alleles in certain geographic areas. Well, that's due to natural selection pressures giving individuals that have that allele some kind of an advantage. So in this case, um, it's anti-malarial properties. So again, the point here is to note that this pot, if we consider the entire human population um, as one population, they are not in genetic equilibrium. Not all individuals have an equal chance of surviving, reproducing, and contributing to the gene pool that in certain geographically isolated areas, um, there is a definite advantage for having that allele. The same can be said with this alcohol dehydrogenase allele. So that's an allele that um, deals with the breakdown of alcohol. And you can see, again, examples of that allele being very much uh, more common in some areas compared to others. The function of the allele or the function of that gene isn't what's important. What's important is that you understand if there's an unequal distribution, that there must be some advantage for having that allele, which is a great indicator that natural selection is taking place and disrupting that genetic equilibrium. One of the extraordinary parts about Darwin's thought process was that he understood that this mechanism of natural selection must require heritability, right? The ability of parents to pass along information to their offspring. 
But the actual mechanism of heritability, things like DNA and genes, had not been completely uncovered yet. And so it wasn't until Mendel and Weissman came along that we had a biological or genetic explanation for the natural selection mechanisms that Darwin was proposing. And so when we combine those two, we get what's called neo-Darwinism, neo meaning new. It's the integration of understandings of natural selection and the science of genetics. And with that new understanding, we can actually redefine what evolution is. So evolution, a cumulative change in the characteristics or heritable characteristics of a population over time. Well, now let's refine that in this neo-Darwinism light to also include allele frequency. Allele frequency is the proportion of an allele in a gene pool. So let's say this is my gene pool um, in generation one. I have two alleles here. I have the dominant allele, big P, and the recessive allele, little p. And I have one, two, three, four, five individuals. So that means there is a total of 10 alleles because each individual has two. If I count the number of dominant alleles, big P's, I'm seeing two out of 10. So my allele frequency for the dominant allele is two out of 10, or, ooh, that's really messy, or 0.2. I can write this as a proportion that will come in handy later. Um, for the recessive, that small p, that is eight out of 10 alleles are this small recessive p, and so that gives me an allele frequency of 0.8. And if I do that for this next generation, what I'm seeing is a change in allele frequency, that this dominant allele is becoming um, more common, and this recessive allele is becoming less common or representing a smaller proportion of the alleles in my population. This is evolution. Evolution can be redefined as a change in allele frequencies of a gene pool. Does it mean a new species has developed? No. Does it mean that some new trait like wings has suddenly appeared? No. Okay, so this is a much more nuanced way of um, determining whether or not evolution is taking place. So if I want to know if evolution is happening in a population, I would need to see if there is a change in the allele frequencies. So I've just showed you kind of a simple example. The reality is that many traits, um, that especially the ones that acted on natural selection, are going to be polygenic in nature. They're going to be controlled by many genes. And so we're going to see a range of phenotypes, usually distributed normally in this bell curve, with most of them being geared here towards the middle. Natural selection, if acting upon that trait, can have one of three different effects. So we can say that it is stabilizing if the middle phenotype is favored, or if the middle phenotype has an advantage rather than those extreme phenotypes. Okay, so again, these are driven by natural selection processes. We can say that natural selection is disruptive if that middle phenotype is at a disadvantage and it's the extreme phenotypes that are more fit or have an advantage in their environment. Directional selection is when I would find a shift towards one end of the bell curve or the other. So one phenotype has a clear advantage um, over the other. And based on these different mechanisms of natural selection, I would start to see different allele frequencies. We can actually calculate and predict allele frequencies um, with a small amount of information using something called the Hardy-Weinberg equation. So the Hardy-Weinberg equation is this, p squared plus two pq plus two, or plus q squared equals one. So let's go through and define these variables. P squared is the frequency of the homozygous dominant genotype. So remember from genetics, homozygous dominant would be something like this. 
2PQ is the frequency of the heterozygous genotype, and Q squared is the frequency of the homozygous recessive genotype. So in this equation here, all of these things represent the frequency of genotypes. If I'm just talking about P and Q on their own, P is the frequency of the dominant allele, while Q is the frequency of the recessive allele. And if I'm talking about a single gene trait, of course, okay, their frequencies when added up together should equal one, the totality of my uh, gene pool there. This is, again, an equation we can use to predict allele frequencies or genotype frequencies, knowing a little bit about a population. And we'll do that here in this example with cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is an autosomal recessive disease. So that means that you have to have the homozygous recessive uh, genotype in order to have that. So I would need two recessive alleles, something like this. Well, I'm not going to write it that way anymore because we now know from our definition of these alleles that the frequency of the homozygous recessive genotype is Q squared. And it's telling us here in this problem that Q squared is about one out of every 3,500 people. What else is this giving us? Not much. It's just asking us what proportion of the population is a carrier. Carriers are going to be heterozygous. So what it's really asking me is what is 2PQ? Okay, so remember, this is my heterozygous uh, frequency. All right, well, before I can do that, let's go ahead and change Q squared into Q. So if Q squared is equal to 1 out of 3,500, in order to find Q, I need to take the square root of that, okay? And that is going to give me about 0 0.0169, so that is my Q. What I also know is that Q plus P has to equal one. So now that I know my Q, I also know that P must be 0 0.9831. This number for Q plus the number for P must equal one. If I'm trying to find out the carrier, that's 2PQ, what I would do is I would take two times my number for P, 0 0.9831, so that's my P, and then I would multiply that by my number for Q, which is 0 0.0169, and I'm getting zero, about 0 0.033. So this is the proportion that is a carrier. That's my 2PQ, 0 0.033, or about 33 out of every 1,000 people in this population that is described by this problem. Now, the Hardy-Weinberg equation has a lot of assumptions for it to work, but it's really powerful. Let's just think about these. This is only going to apply to genes that have two alleles. So something like blood type, where there are three alleles, we would not be able to use this equation. We also have to assume that all of the following conditions have been met, that there are no mutations, so no new alleles, that all of the rating, uh, mating is random. That means every individual has an equal chance of passing along their genes. Genetic equilibrium is basically what we're getting at here, that there's no immigration or emigration. We're talking about a very large population, so any like small um, bits of passing along genes, it doesn't have a, an effect on the larger gene pool, and that there is no natural selection. So again, if the Hardy-Weinberg equation accurately predicts the reality, then that population is in genetic equilibrium. All of these things are describing genetic equilibrium. So in that previous example, when we were given the proportion that have cystic fibrosis, and we were able to calculate the proportion of people that are carriers, 
if our prediction using the equation actually matches what we um, are seeing in reality, then no natural selection is taking place and that population is in genetic equilibrium. If we were to calculate um, that percentage and then measure it in real life, and it's not a match, then that tells us that one of these conditions is not being met and that that, evolute, that population is evolving. So the Hardy-Weinberg equation is really a powerful tool to help us look at real data versus expected uh, outcomes and to be able to determine if that population is in genetic equilibrium or if evolution is taking place. And we'll end this video with an important caveat here, which is that natural selection is, of course, not the only thing that can drive changes in population or evolution. Okay, so any kind of selection is going to cause evolution because selection will result in a change in allele frequencies. In natural selection, there's some kind of environmental pressure that is controlling reproduction. So we looked at that here with this um, uh, development of antibiotic resistance. In artificial selection, humans are controlling the reproduction in order to get desirable traits. So this is the thought behind domestication of plants and animals, that if I control who gets to reproduce to make the next population, that population will have different allele frequencies than the original one. The result is the same. Okay, evolution and a change of allele frequencies. What differs is the mechanism by which that takes place.